Okay, bonjour à tous. Donc, évidemment, c'est un, un grand plaisir pour moi et un honneur de participer à cette conférence qui, qui célèbre Gilles. Je ne sais pas comment tu ressens ça, j'ai une conférence qui te célèbre comme ça. Je ne sais pas si c'est quelque chose que tu aurais imaginé. Mais en tout cas, moi, je trouve que c'est une très, très bonne initiative et je remercie les organisateurs pour leur super boulot. Donc, je vais vous parler de volatilité RAF. Donc, je commence en français, je suis en anglais. Je vais vous parler de volatilité RAF et je dis RAF Volatility Tour with Hawks, Heston, Zumbar et Professeur Pages. Alors, pourquoi, pourquoi Professeur Pages, si j'arrive à changer les slides C'est bon, je te fais un signe. Ah bah, ok. Ok, donc euh, bon, ça a l'air de marcher. Donc pourquoi professeur Pages En fait, c'est euh, quelque chose que j'ai emprunté à Jean Jacod, qui est là-bas. Parce que quand j'étais ici, euh, dans, le même, dans le couloir, euh, j'entendais qu'à chaque fois que, que Jean venait dans le couloir, euh, Gilles, tu l'appelais professeur, euh, professeur Jacod, et Jean, tu répondais professeur Pages. Donc je ne sais pas, j'ai gardé ça depuis. Donc c'est pour ça que je t'appelle professeur Pages. Et évidemment, euh, bah, Gilles, euh, là, c'est la, la partie où je jette des fleurs. Et je te considère vraiment comme un modèle et même un mentor euh, de, fin, depuis que je suis arrivé ici. Et euh, je tiens à souligner, parce que moi, je le vois au quotidien, euh, la manière dont tu t'occupes du, du master Proba Finance. Euh, enfin, voilà, C'est quelque chose, je pense, d'exceptionnel. Et, et tu nous mets tous mal à l'aise avec euh, Nizar et Emmanuel, euh, voilà, parce qu'on n'est pas capable de s'en occuper aussi bien que toi. Donc, euh, et, euh, et évidemment, on pourrait parler de, de, de plein d'aspects de ta personnalité. Il y en a qui ont été évoqués depuis ce matin, il y en a d'autres qui pourraient être évoqués. Euh, un petit souvenir personnel, un truc que j'avais trouvé particulièrement sympa et qui m'avait permis de découvrir un, une autre facette de ta personnalité. C'était euh, le voyage qu'on avait fait euh, Jérusalem et j'avais pu voir euh, ta connexion divine. Euh, j'avais senti le côté euh, illumination. Donc ça, c'est Via Dolorosa, c'est le chemin que Jésus a pris euh, avant la crucifixion. Et voilà, j'ai rraiment vu, je, je dis de sourire autant et voilà, je connaissais cet aspect de ta personnalité. Et, euh, et ton, ton ouverture, en fait, ta proximité spirituelle avec euh, plusieurs dieux, parce que voilà, la même journée, on, a, on avait été voir d'autres dieux et tu étais tout aussi ouvert. Donc, euh, c'est sympa. Il y a Jean-François Chassagneux qui était avec nous. Donc, voilà, ça, c'était un petit souvenir euh, très sympa avec toi. Et, euh, et d'autres choses dont je pourrais parler, euh, par exemple, tes, tes, tes compétences d'acteur. Alors, euh, je n'ai pas le temps de le faire, et voilà, mais pour ceux que ça intéresse, euh, voilà, je recommande, vous pouvez trouver des choses intéressantes sur YouTube, euh, sur les compétences artistiques de Gilles. Bon, néanmoins, c est, c est, on ne va pas passer tout notre temps là-dessus. Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, je voudrais plutôt euh, parler des contributions scientifiques, euh, que tu as certaines de tes contributions scientifiques, et surtout, euh, comment elles ont joué un rôle dans, dans ce que j'ai moi-même, dans des choses qui m'ont intéressé bah, moi-même. All right, so I'm going to switch to English now. And uh, so the topic of the talk is, is this is about rough volatility and the connection and some connection of what Gilles has done with, uh, with rough volatility. So the starting point of all this um, story and theory of rough volatility is just that when you take a financial asset and we, when you just look at the volatility of financial asset, which is just a basic quantity, if you consider that, well, what you see is that this signal is a very rough signal. Okay, so and, and when we mean it's a rough signal, uh, we are just saying that in terms of smoothness of the sample pass, in terms of regularity, this is something which looks definitely rough, and it looks, in fact, much rougher than a brilliant motion, for example. So if you look at that, you would never model that with a brilliant motion. It's some definitely rougher than a brilliant motion. And so what has been shown is that, well, if you consider the log of the volatility, uh, you can model that very well if you just consider that the log of the volatility is a fractional Brownian motion, but with a very small value for the Hearst parameter. So I guess like everybody here knows about the fractional Brownian motion. I don't need to, to redefine it. And, but I should mention that this idea of modeling the volatility with a fractional Brownian motion, it's, it's not a new idea. And actually, that's back to the work of Conte and Renault. And they, they were the first to, to use fractional Brownian motion to, to model the volatility. And OK, I mean, many people know that this is somehow a first connection to you, Gilles. This, The fact that the first work on modeling the volatility with a fractional brand motion is, is due to content run. Right, so, however, what we do uh, in contrast to the work of content run, instead of taking a large value for the Hearst parameter, we take a very small value of the Hearst parameter because 
I remind you that this value of the Hertz parameter is giving you the smoothness of a sample pass. And typically what you find on data is that the Hertz parameter is close to 0.1 and 0.1 corresponds to earlier smoothness of order 0.1, right? So basically what you can show is that just with this very simple model, you can retrieve all the stylus files of volatility time series. And more than that, you can at the same time retrieve the behavior of the so-called implied volatility surface in, in finance. So, so you have a very simple model, which is just saying that the log volatility is a fractional brand motion with a small value for the Hertz parameter. And, and just with that, you can uh, retrieve both the behavior of volatility time series and implied volatility surface. And many people have, have looked at uh, this result. I mean, it has, this result has been found on more than 6,000 of assets. And so that's why it was kind of surprising that, I mean, systematically you conclude that volatility is rough. So it means that systematically such very simple model uh, fit the data. So we try to understand why it was the case. And actually what I'm gonna show you is that there are some microstructural foundation for that, which means that you can understand from the behavior of market participants why volatility is rough. And actually the fact that the volatility is rough is just a consequence of the behavior of market participants. So, in fact, this is mechanical. You have no choice. Volatility has to be rough. This is the, the only type of process that can model the market. And, but also today, I would like to talk about uh, some very particular uh, property of rough volatility, which is the zoom back effect. So I'm going to talk about this. And speaking about options, because uh, I mean, particularly Gina has worked a lot about uh, uh, option pricing and technical aspects. We also understand why the rough volatility model, they are good for classical options. But today I would also like to mention some results about VIX options, which are very specific options, but heavily traded uh, on the market. So fractional brand motion, you, you all know about it. I just want to remind you this uh, representation of the fractional brand motion that essentially, I mean, a way to represent the fractional brand motion is just to start with a classical brand motion and to consider the integral of this explosion KNL here, T minus S to the power H minus one half. And this is the, the representation that I'm gonna use. So for me, the fractional brand motion is uh, essentially gonna be given by this uh, model Bros von S representation that we have. All right, so um, what I want to do in this uh, second part is to give some uh, macrostructural foundation of rough volatility, which means that I want to explain from what's happening on the market at the very high frequency level. I want to explain why this is generating rough volatility. So I remind you that this signal that I've showed you, it's, it's the volatility of an asset. I mean, the S&P, which is something very standard over 10 years. So, okay, so this is, 10 years of data. Now what I want to do here, I want to model data over one day. Okay, I want to model data over one day and I want to get a model in which I'm gonna be able to put the important behavior of market participants at the high frequency scale, so over one day. And then once I'm gonna be done, I'm gonna take time, go to infinity and show that when time goes to infinity, I want to investigate the limiting model that I'm, I'm gonna have. So I want to understand the consequence of the behavior of the market participant at the high frequency level, I want to understand the long-term consequences of that, okay? So what I want to do here, again, I want a tick by tick model, which means that I want a model which is moving like plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, something like that, because I mean, in practice, prices are moving like that. And I want a model in which I'm able to incorporate all the important behavior of market participants at the very high frequency scale. Okay, so I want to, to be able to incorporate the important stylus facts uh, at the high frequency scale. So uh, just let me give you a list of four important stylus facts. So the, the first important stylus fact that you observed at, at high frequency is that, well, most of the order that you have on the market, they have sort of somehow no economic motivation. What I mean by that is just not just that people have no economic motivation per se, but it's just saying that most of the people, they are not buying and selling because they believe that I'm gonna buy now and I'm gonna make money in 10 years because I believe in the company. Okay, this is not what's happening on the market. Most of the orders, they are, they are sent by algorithm which are following other algorithms. Okay, so, I mean, what we say is that financial markets are highly endogenous, okay, in the sense that there are many orders that you, that you have on the market just because they are reacting to other orders. Okay, so there's a large endogenous part on the market. Another way to see it is that if you cut any information sources, I mean, you cut TV, radio, Bloomberg, whatever, and if you open the market, also there is absolutely no information, the prices, they are gonna move. Okay, they are gonna move because this is just like 
algorithm which are reacting to trading algorithm. So it's a high degree of identity of the market. Uh, it has been studied a lot in particular by uh, the group of Bouchot uh, at CFM. The second stylus fact, which is uh, very important, is that actually it's hard to make money. So it's hard to make money, which means that even at the high frequency setting, I mean, finding a strategy which is gonna ensure you some wealth after some time, it's very compli it's, it's complicated, right? I mean, I mean, if you and me, we try to do that in, in our house, it's not gonna work. So a way to say it in financial term is that you have some no arbitrage principles, also at the high frequency scale, okay? So there are some mechanism preventing statistical arbitrage. It's, it's complicated to make money at high frequency. And I mean, if you look at people doing high frequency trading, actually there are very few companies now. Okay, it's very few companies because it's complicated to make money at high frequency. I mean, you can rephrase it by the market are relatively efficient if you want. Uh, the third status fact, which is something pretty obvious, but not often taken into account, is the fact that actually when you buy and you sell, it's not symmetric action. Okay, buying and selling, it's not symmetric action, but it's the same in, in real life in the sense that, well, if you're buying your car or if you're selling your car, typically you're not in the same position. If you're selling your car, I mean, usually you sell your car because you need some money, you need to change your car, so you have some kind of urgency. If you're buying the car, I mean, some, it's a bit different. You have, usually have more time and so on. In the market, it's the same thing, right? So if you consider a market maker, for example, he will not react in a symmetric manner after a buy order or a sell order. So there is some kind of asymmetry between buying and selling. And the last status fact is the fact that on the market, you have a large, I mean, significant proportion of transactions which are due to what we call meter order splitting. So what is meter order splitting is the fact that if you want to buy 50 million shares, okay, you're not gonna do it in one second. If you, buy, if you want to buy 50 million shares, you're gonna start now, and maybe you're gonna finish that in, in four hours. Okay, you're gonna split your, what we call meter order, you're gonna split your meter order in child order. Okay, so this is the so-called meter order splitting. You have this giant order, like say 50 million share that you want to buy or sell, and you're gonna split that uh, over time. Okay, so now how, how am I gonna incorporate this, this four stylus fact in my, my high frequency model? So I'm gonna do something very simple. I'm just gonna use Hox processes. Okay, so I'm gonna use Hox processes. I know that everybody knows about Hox processes here, and I'm gonna use Hox processes in dimension two. So lambda plus is gonna be the intensity of my first component. Lambda minus is the intensity of my second component. And N plus, uh, so let's, let's look at the price model. My final model would just be N plus minus N minus. Okay, so the couple N plus N minus is a Hawks process. And what I'm looking at is that my price is moving as N plus minus N minus. So N plus is when the, is moving by plus one my, when my price is jumping by plus one. N minus is moving by plus one, my, my price is jumping by minus one. Okay, so my price is doing plus one, minus one. The plus one are given by N plus, the minus one are given by N minus. And so if you look at uh, the specification of my Hawks process, it, it means that phi one is a self-exciting features. It's the influence of the past upward jump of my price on the future upward jumps. Phi four is also a self-exciting feature. It's the influence of the past downward jump of my price on the future downward jumps. And for example, phi three is a mutually exciting feature. It's the influence of the past downward jump on the future upward jumps, okay? And symmetrically on phi two. So what is very nice with the Hawks processes is that the location of the past upward jumps, they have an influence on the future upward and downward jumps and the same for the downward jumps. What is, why is this model quite convenient? Because actually this model, I mean, it's very easy to, to encode the four stylus facts that I've mentioned in, in this model. So what we have is that, remember that we had these four stylus facts and for these four stylus facts, so the first one was this high degree of endogeneity. So I, I don't have much time to go into the detail, but this high degree of endogeneity means that the market is close to sort of critical state, okay? Close to non-stationary state. And how do you model that in a hog setting? Well, it's simply saying that the L1 norm of the largest eigenvalue of this matrix has to be close to one. It's the very natural thing. It's like, if you think about Galton Watson, for example, it's almost the critical case of Galton Watson. So the Hawks processes, they have a connection with population processes. If you think about Galton Watson, you know that the critical case is when the expectation of size is equal to one. Here, I mean, it's exactly the same phenomenon. It means that we have to be close to critical case. 
Okay, so close to critical case means that the L1 norm of this largest cycle value is close to one. I mean, it's not very easy to understand why like this, but trust me, it's exactly like, I mean, you have a population interpretation of the Hox processes, and it's exactly like in the case of Galton Watson, when you take like expectation of Xi close to one. So the no arbitrage condition, the fact that it's complicated to make money, I mean, it's, uh, I'm just gonna assume that expectation of N plus equal to expectation of N minus. So on average, my price is jumping as much with upward jumps than downward jumps, okay? And to obtain that, it's just assuming that phi one plus phi three is equal to phi two plus phi four. The fact that buying is different from selling, well, it's just that I have to put some asymmetry in this matrix here. Okay, so I have to put some asymmetry in my kernel matrix and my asymmetry, I get it but saying that phi three is not going to be equal to phi two. Phi three is going to be equal to beta phi two. And finally, the meta order splitting. So remember that the meta order splitting is the fact that if I want to buy a lot of shares, I'm going to start now and in four hours. So it means that if I'm starting now, the first child order that I'm sending now on the market, it is somehow connecting to the last child order that I'm going to send in four hours. So even if there is four hours between these two orders, there is connection between the two orders. And so the thing is that all the functions, how I, am I gonna translate that in the Hawk setting? Well, I'm gonna translate that by the fact that the function, they're gonna be slowly decaying. Okay, so all the influence function in my Hox model, they're gonna be slowly decaying because even if I have a lot of time between events, well, the event still matters. Okay, so I'm now, something that happened four hours later, four hours earlier, sorry, it's still gonna have an influence on what's going on now. And that's why all these functions are gonna be slowly decaying. And this is what you obtain if you, I mean, you look at calibration on the market and you obtain that this function, all these functions here, they are behaving at one divided by X per one, one plus alpha with alpha around 0.6. Okay, so now I have my high frequency model. Okay, so my high frequency model is simply this and plus minus and minus. And I'm gonna use this, specific, this particular specification of this high frequency model, okay? So I'm taking this model, which is based on Hox processes, and I'm taking this very specific parameterization. And now what I want to do is very simple. I want to take, I want to take time, go to infinity. Okay, I want to take time, go to infinity and do rescaling because I want to see like, okay, this is a daily model. I mean, this is an intraday model and I want to see what's going on if I launch my model for let's say, let's say five years, I want to see what's coming out of that. So how, how to do that? How to do that? Well, what we can do is that we're gonna reinterpret this sequence of nearly unstable Hox processes. So we call them nearly unstable because we are close to this instability condition we're gonna reinterpret them as sequence of stochastic differential equations. Okay, so we're gonna reinterpret that as sequence of stochastic differential equations, but they are not standard stochastic differential equations in the sense that they are driven by uh, discontinuous martingales. Okay, so we have sequence of stochastic differential equation driven by discontinuous martingales, and I want to go to the limit of this sequence of stochastic differential equations. Okay, and how to do that? Well, to, to, to be able to do that, what we did is that we just revisited a result by uh, Jakubowski, Memin, and Gilles, and which is just telling you that if you have a sequence of SDEs, if you can show that the drift functions converge in some sense, the variety functions converge in some sense, and that uh, the driver, the Martingale driver converges also in some sense, well, you can show that you have convergence in load of your sequence of SDE toward the limiting SDE. Okay, so we took this result for uh, Jacob Mema and Pages. We visited a bit of result, and this was the key to obtain this result. So we, we were very happy to, to find this result, which was not uh, really stated in, in the right way in, in the book of, uh, I mean, in the way we needed in the, in the book of uh, Jean. So we really needed to, to go to this paper and kind of save our lives. And what we could finally show thanks to this result is that this limit, this sequence of high frequency models, it converges to this dynamic, okay? So if you take this high frequency model, you go, long, you go on the long term, this is the dynamic that you're gonna have. And if you look at that, I mean, if you're familiar with finance, I mean, what you recognize, this is a stochastic volatility model, okay? And the volatility is driven by the, the second equation here. And the first thing that you can observe is that if you take alpha equal to one, this is the classical Heston model. Even if you're not familiar with finance, what you, you can you recognize the CIR model, the square root model, the failure model, you can call it whatever you want. But if you take alpha equal to one, you recognize this is the classical Heston model. The thing is that alpha is around 0.6, 
And what you will also recognize that this T minus S to power, power alpha minus one, this is exactly the kernel that you need to build a fractional band motion. Okay, so this is exactly the fractional kernel that you have in the uh, mandel bros van Ness representation of the fractional band motion. So this is simply what? This is a rough version of the Heston model. Okay, this is a rough version of a Heston model. Why it's rough? Because alpha is around 0.6. Okay, and alpha corresponds to, uh, and h corresponds to alpha minus one half. So what you obtain is that h should be around 0.1. Okay, if you believe the alpha is around 0.6, it corresponds to h around 0.1, which is what you find on data. So basically what we have just shown here is that if you put together, I mean, you put together very reasonable behavior of market participants at the high frequency scale, I mean, what you obtain is that automatically it generates rough volatility. So it's just not exactly a fractional, fractional band motion. This is a rough Heston process, but it's kind of a rough volatility model. Okay, so it's, it's very nice because it, it's showing you that actually this volatility stuff is just mechanical. Okay, it's just mechanical. You put the behavior of market participant and you obtain a rough volatility in the liquid. So now, I mean, it's a good result. I mean, it's nice to understand the behavior of market, but now if you want to apply this in finance, you need to do pricing and hedging. And not going into the details, but thanks to this connection that we have between the Hawks processes and this limit, what we could obtain is to obtain the, the characteristic function of the log price in the Raffeston model. So basically the way we did is that we know that we have this sequence based on Hawks model that converge. We could compute the characteristic function of the Hawks processes and going to the limit, of course, this is convergence in law. So going to the limit, we get the, conversion, we get the characteristic function of the log price. And when you do finance, if you have the characteristic function of the log price of a process, you can do price, I mean, you can give prices to complex products based on that. Okay, so you have free inversion methods and you can give uh, prices to product doing that. So we could obtain the characteristic function of the log price and we were kind of happy because if you're familiar with finance, the formula that we get is the exact same formula that the one you get in the classical paper by Heston. So the Heston model is very famous in finance and celebrated because there is a closed form formula for, uh, for the characteristic function of the log price. What you obtain in the rough Heston model, this is the exact same formula. Okay, so you have the same formula in the rough Heston model than what you have in the classical Heston model, except that in the Heston model, you have a Riccati equation that appears in the solution. And the Riccati equation, you have an explicit solution. In the Raffeston model, you get the exact same Riccati equation, except that if you look on the left here, the, you have to replace the classical time derivative by a fractional derivative. Okay, so this is a, the formula is quite nice because it's exactly the same, but you have to replace the classical time derivative by the fractional derivative. And the thing is that this is very complicated. I mean, I don't know if it's very complicated, but all the algorithm that we have to solve numerically this. Uh, fractional, fractional Riccati equation, they were really slow. Okay, they were really slow. And in terms of doing option pricing, I mean, they, they were too slow to be, uh, to be reasonable to use for option pricing. So I went to Gilles' office. I, I mean, we're just discussing something and say, okay, I mean, we have this Riccati equation and uh, I mean, we need to accelerate the numerics to do that. And we, we were not able to do it. We didn't know how to do it. And uh, so luckily we discussed uh, this problem with Gilles and uh, happy, I mean, we are quite happy because uh, Gilles could derive a, a very nice uh, numerical scheme with Caligaro uh, uh, and Graceli. So Georgia is gonna talk about it. So uh, you will have more data here, but this is really thanks to the contribution of Gilles that we could sort of explain that this model was not only nice in terms of academic result, but it's really useful for practice because, I mean, without the numerical method, I mean, the model can be as nice as you want if you cannot like use it uh, in an efficient way. I mean, no, nobody's gonna use it in practice. Okay, so this is, I mean, the second um, key contribution, I mean, the third key contribution of the, the Pages family in this rough volatility. So first was introducing fractional brain motion in the volatility. Then it was your theorem with Jakubowski and Mema, and then this numerical method for the rough estimate. In the last 10 minutes, I'd just like to, to tell you about I mean, sort of second generation rough volatility models and talking about um, uh, the zoom back effect. So when we discuss with people, I mean, th there were two nice comments about the, the, the Raffeston model, uh, notably uh, 
comment uh, from actually from you, Gilles, from Jean, from uh, Jean-Philippe Bouchot. So there was the a first comment, which is more um, sort of for the, the mathematical understanding, is that when you do these uh, scaling limits and so on, you always get square root. You know the square root process in the end. If you do population, you always get square root also because it's just that you have a martingale, you renormalize by the square root of the martingale. So in the end, you you have a dm divided by square root times square root, and so you get square root in the limit. Okay, because you have your martingale, you divide you divide by the quadratic variation, the square, the quadratic variation to get a brand motion, and so you always good, uh, get square root. Again, if you think about Galton Watson, it's I mean the continuous version of Galton Watson. You have like the failure process. So the first thing that we wanted to understand is that can we go beyond the square root and actually i mean i don't go into the detail but it also makes sense for finance which i mean can we have something which is so we call it super heston which means that i would like to get something different than square root here i would like to get uh, something fatter than square root okay and typically we like to say that the volatility is log normal okay so for example can I get something reasonable with square instead of square root of v having v, for example? Okay, can I build a process like this where I get a limiting process which goes beyond the square root? Okay, so this is the super Heston part. And another thing that we want to get is uh, so is the so-called zoom back effect. So the zoom back effect is something quite fascinating, but not easy to understand because it, it's uh, it's in the econophysic literature, so you you don't find a lot of sort of proper mathematical statement but when you talk to econophysicists the first thing that they tell you when you ask because you read about zoom back effect but when you ask what is zoom back effect exactly so think about it it's like i'm giving you the sample pass of a stock okay so i take my piece of paper i'm giving you the sample pass of a stock but maybe i'm turning the paper around okay and i'm not telling you and then i'm asking you the question give me the direction of time okay is time going this way or time going this way Okay, so the point is that if you're very good in finance, you know the market very well, you should be able to tell me. Okay, and the thing is that with all even multidimensional Markovian model, they are sort of time reversal invariant. You have like transition densities and so on. So most of the classical mathematical model, I mean, you cannot find the direction of time. Okay, because it's, I mean, you are Markovian in some dimension at least. And so you have transition densities and you, you can invert. But okay, this is not a very mathematical statement. So we try to, to go in the literature. And so what we could read about is that what they call zoom back also is sort of a, 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 a feedback of the drift on the volatility. Okay, so a feedback of the drift uh, of the price on the volatility. So, so the drift should have an effect itself in the volatility. So when the price returns should have a direct effect in the volatility. And, and the way people, I mean, when you look in, in this physics paper, the, the way people measure that, I mean, the experience that they were doing is that they were comparing the predictive. So they were showing that squared return, they are better for so past square return, they are better forecast of future integrated volatility than past volatility is a good forecast of squared return. Okay, so we know squared and volatility. I mean, it's not about finance here, it's just about stochastic calculus, it's kind of the same. But what they show on data is that if you use squared return to forecast future volatility, is better than, I mean, there is more forecasting power here than using past volatilities to forecast square returns. And I mean, they compute that on data, they compute correlation, and indeed they show that the correlation are not the same. Okay, so this is the way they, they were computing the zoom back effect. And so we tried to see if this was true in, in the Raph Heston model. Okay, so we try to, so we compute in the Raph Heston model the correlation between past square return and future integrated volatility and the correlation between past integrated volatility and future square return. And we could show that in the Heston model, this is not the same, okay? So somehow we thought, okay, there is zoom back effect in the Heston model because, I mean, these two correlations are not the same. And you see that if H equal to one half, which comes to the classical Heston, indeed it disappears. But again, discussing with people for, with like Jean-Philippe Bouchot, he's saying, yeah, but it's not the thing. And indeed, the this zoom back effect that we get in the Raph Heston, it's not really coming from this feedback that is at the origin of the idea of zoom back. Okay, this, I mean, in the paper by zoom back is really speaking about this feedback of return in volatility. And in the Raph Heston model, what you get is that this is essentially an effect of the correlation between the brand motion driving the price and the brand motion driving the volatility. <clears throat> Sorry. 
and, uh, and, yeah, and this effect is magnified because you are in a rough setting. So what we wanted to do here is to properly define what we're going to call zoom back effect or strong zoom back effect. And what is going to be the strong zoom back effect for us, and I think this is the right notion of zoom back effect, it's simply the fact that the future law of the volatility, so we are in a non-Markovian setting here, right? This is, this is fractional. But the future law of the volatility, it should depend on the past, of the, on the past, but not only through the past of the volatility. Okay, so it means that if I'm looking at the future law of the volatility, it depends on the whole past, but not only through the past of the volatility, it should also somehow depend on the returns. And this is what we call zoom back. In way, it's when the future law of the volatility depends on the past, but not only through the past of the volatility itself. Okay, the returns should have a role. So, how to build a model? I mean, now we want it to be a model which has these super Heston features for the volatility and also that exhibits zoom back effect. So the idea was the same for us. We're starting from high frequency, we're starting from the microstructure. Okay, and so what we did is consider again a Hawks based model. So the Hawks model here is going to be very simple. What we're going to do is that I'm going to take a high frequency model, and when I, when I have an event, the price is just jumping by plus one of minus one with parity one half. Okay, so each time there is an event, the price is jumping by plus one minus one with parity one half, and the location of the event is given by a point process with the intensity lambda t. And what you see, what is lambda t? So the first point you recognize a Hox process in dimension one. Okay, mu plus integral of phi at the end, just a Hox process in dimension one. But what we are adding here is the process z. And what you see is that z, what is z? So z is the integral of kdp. So basically, p is your price. So z is the moving average of your returns, or your past return. So for example, if, if your price is doing like, is oscillating in the past. So if your price is doing like plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, your price is oscillating. So Z is gonna be small. So Z square is gonna be small. So intensity is gonna be small, okay? So if on the contrary, your, your price is drifting in your recent past. So if your price is doing like plus one, plus one, plus one, or minus one, minus one, minus one, Z is gonna be large. So Z square is gonna be large. So intensity is gonna be large. So you're gonna, you're gonna get a lot of jumps, okay? So we are really like, putting a feedback of the price return in the intensity with the idea that if we put a feedback of price return in the intensity at the high frequency level, on the long run, it should uh, relate to the volatility. And we did exactly the same as what I've explained in the first part. We take this high frequency model and we go to the limit, okay? And I'm gonna just start with, um, maybe only much in this case, even I take phi equal to zero, okay? I'm gonna take phi equal to zero here, okay? And so if I take phi equal to zero, I look at the long-term limit of this model. This is what I obtain. So what I'm obtaining is that my price, this is again a stochastic volatility model, okay? And the volatility here that you get is just given by the square of this moving average of the past price returns. Okay, so this is a very particular model where the volatility is simply given by a moving the square of a moving average of the past price returns, okay? And so when you look at this model, obviously you get the zoom back effect, okay? So this is, again, this is in the very simple case where phi is equal to zero. So obviously you get feedback effect, you get the zoom back effect because your volatility itself is just given by the feedback of the returns, okay? The feedback of the return is really directly feeding the volatility. So of course you get zoom back effect. And more than that, I mean, if you just do a bit of calculus, what you can show is that Z, okay, which is uh, the square of volatility, satisfy this equation here, okay? So what you obtain is that now your volatility, instead of being square root, you're close to log normality, right? Because the square root of Z has been replaced by absolute value of Z, okay? And now, I mean, if I take K as a fractional kernel, okay, if K is fractional, but if K is a fractional kernel, this process Z is gonna, of course, exhibit a rough volatility uh, behavior. Okay, so you see doing that, I mean, which is a very simple procedure, what I'm able to obtain is that I have a volatility which has some zoom back effect, which is super hesitant, the sense that it's almost log normal, and it's rough volatility because if I take K, uh, which is fractional, I'm gonna obtain rough volatility. Uh, for those who are familiar with this kind of stuff, there is something very specific here compared to what I've explained in the first part. In the first part, if you remember, the rough behavior, it was coming from the tail of the kernel. It was the fact that phi was slowly decreasing. 
Okay, because five was solely decreasing, I get five, I get rough volatility. Here you get rough volatility because of the behavior of k in zero. Okay, so it's very very different actually what's going on in these two cases. Here, what matters is the behavior of k in zero. In the other case, it was the behavior of phi at plus infinity. So this is in the case phi equal to zero. I will not go into the detail. I mean, I can take also the case where phi is not equal to zero. Then you get rough volatility from the behavior of phi and Okay, it is another way to obtain a stochastic volatility model with rough volatility, log normal behavior, and zoom back effect. Okay, so I don't go into the detail, but it's a bit more involved, and uh, but we can do it. Okay, final thing. So I'm just gonna stop on. I mean, just gonna uh, emphasize this model here. So now we call this model quadratic Raffeston model instead of Raffeston model that we had before. And why is this model interesting for practice? Well, this is for the following thing, and it's gonna be my last stuff. So I'm just taking the model, which is uh, the limit that I've shown you. Okay, I'm just taking this model. I'm just adding a bit of asymmetry in the volatility. The goal is the fact that to just to say that positive price returns should not have the same effect as negative price returns. Okay, so negative prices have more effect on volatility than positive prices. Okay, because I mean, the volatility is larger when you have like negative trend than when you have positive trend. So I'm just adding this little stuff. And what, what, what we can do with this quadratic Raffeston model is the following. I mean, what, it's very nice to consider this uh, problem of uh, option calibration of the SPX and the VIX. I'm not going into the detail, just should know that the SPX is just the most classical index in the world. This is the uh, American index of the, the SP500. And the VIX is the volatility index, okay? And you have option on the SPX and option on the VIX which are both of them heavily traded. They are two of the most important uh, trading instruments in the world. And what is very hard to do is having a model which is at the same time consistent from option on the S&P and option on the VIX. Okay, so typically if you can fit one model, if you, if you can fit the S&P, you can fit the VIX and convert. And there was a conjecture that you cannot fit uh, implied volatility surfaces for the S&P and the VIX with a model with continuous pass. Okay, so there was a conjecture like this. And in the literature, we, we could have the intuition that what you need to do so actually is exactly the zoom back effect. And that using a model with zoom back effect, maybe you can succeed in, in, in doing that. And so, I mean, it was very natural for us to just take this model, right? Which was our limiting model with zoom back effect. We take this one and just to show you some graphs. So, the model is in green, okay, and in uh, red and blue, you get uh, the beta quote of the market, so the, the market price is there, and you're happy if you're close to that. So this is for the S&P, just a given day in history. This is the implied volatility surface of the S&P, so you, so you can see that we can reproduce very well the implied volatility surface of the S&P. And what was super nice is that for the VIX, okay, you also reproduce at the same time the implied volatility surface of the VIX. Okay, so it was kind of luck because we were working on, on the zoom back effect and then reading the literature on this uh, joint calibration problem between SNP and VIX, we realized that the zoom back effect was exactly the, the missing piece. Okay, so I'm going to stop here with this is my last slide just to tell you that about this joint calibration problem between SNP and VIX. In the end, we have a model with just six parameters which fit at the same time. Uh, implied volatility of the VIX and implied volatility of the S&P. Final issue, which is a big issue, is that now the model is like this. Okay, so, and you have the square here. So final issue is uh, getting efficient calibration methods. So which means that efficient method to, to simulate the model and having prices. And I think this is where I should continue further the discussion with you, Gilles. Uh, there still works to be done on that. Thank you very much.